Let's open our Bible, shall we, to the book of Exodus, chapter 4. Today's message is part three in our series, Faith and Family. Exodus chapter 4, the reading will be verse number 24 through verse number 26. On the trip at an overnight campsite, it happened that the Lord confronted him and sought to put him to death. So Zephora took a flint, cut off her son's foreskin, and threw it at Moses' feet. Then she said, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. At that time, she said, you are a bridegroom of blood, referring to the circumcision. Faith and family, part three. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for this gathering, that indeed, Lord, you have been worshiped. Your people have been edified through song. And now, Father, we pray that the text that's before us, that the Holy Spirit would truly be our teacher, our counselor, that he might direct our thinking, that he might strengthen us in an inner man, that it might be well for our families and for ourselves. We ask this all in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Is there drama in your home, law enforcement, domestic violence, creditors, emotional meltdowns, fussing and fighting, dirty habits, dirty little secrets, unmanageable children, the cutting off of utilities, profane speech, passive aggressive resentful comments and gestures. Amazingly, both spouses may be professed Christians. Then why all the drama? Why all the fireworks? In many instances, the couples have a fluctuating faith. During good times, faith appears to be intact, and then during difficult times, faith takes a flight. And during difficult times, one begins to reason Faith really doesn't work in this instance, so I need to revert back to my self-managing of this situation. And of course, when self is in control rather than the Holy Spirit, then things tend to spin out of control. Perhaps you're at a point of frustration in which your recurring thoughts are starting all over again with someone else. Conflicted, do I stay or go? Confused, how did I get myself in such a situation? Concern, is this what the rest of my life will look like? Faith and family, part three. All of us this morning have immense faith for God's servant, Moses. He grew up a prince, would later become a prophet, priest, the lawgiver, the deliverer, the emancipator, the wilderness shepherd, the military leader, the poet, the songwriter, judge, counselor, and on and on. A strong case could be made that Moses is perhaps one of the five greatest men to ever walk this earth. And all of that being said, Moses' family life, marriage, and parenting had his share of drama and fireworks. You see, Moses' marriage to Sephora encountered times of disfavor, disagreement, and even physical and emotional distance. And yet the Lord was faithful to Moses. He did not abandon him even when Moses was wrong. And God did not give up on Moses, and neither does he give up on you and I. Let the church say amen. So exactly, what did God do then in Moses' life to turn his marriage and family around? God brought forth painful correction and timely counsel to chisel away at the blind spots of Moses' life and his weaknesses. And as with Moses, there are couples here today, you, if you would, are experiencing God's painful correction. And God has timely counsel awaiting you to restore and renew your failing marriages. A recurring problem in many marriages is that of a leadership crisis. Sometimes it can be as simple as either the husband can't lead, he lacks leadership qualities, or his wife won't let him lead. You see, a man may have tremendous leadership skills in the business community, as a military leader, as a city administrator, he may be a tremendous legislator. And yet, when it comes to the home, he may be emotionally disengaged, inattentive, up and down as a husband and as a father. You see, leadership in the home often requires a different set of skills. In other words, leadership in the home requires nurturing, patience, affirmation, sensitivity, attentiveness, and priority. You see, different skill sets are needed in different settings. 
Therefore, there are so many men that are baffled. How is it that I can garner so much respect and admiration outside the home, but when it comes to my wife and children, they are not impressed with me or have so little respect for me? You see, beloved, the home sometimes needs a different set of skills. Let the church say amen, because the dynamics are different. You see, outside the home, the man should be accomplishment-driven, but inside the home, he needs to be affirmation-driven, that he provides his wife and children with large dosage of affirmation. And in this morning's message, Faith and Family, Part 3, let's consider the painful correction and timely counsel that God wants to bring to bear to enrich and grow our marriages and our families. The first point I want you to jot down is point number one is this. Moses' deference to his wife was almost deadly. Moses' deference to his wife was almost deadly. Look at verse 24 and 25. On the trip at an overnight campsite, it happened that the Lord confronted him and sought to put him to death. So Zephorah took a flint, cut off her son's foreskin, and threw it at Moses' feet. Then she said, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. Moses' deference to his wife almost was deadly. In the previous chapter, there was the burning bush experience that God appeared to Moses in the burning bush and gave him the commission to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people Israel go that they may worship me. And Moses, being obedient to the commission of God, he takes his wife Sephora and he takes their two sons and they begin the pilgrimage to Egypt to carry out the commission. But it is a long journey. So they stop at a campsite for the night. And at the campsite, God, if you will, begins the process to put Moses to death. You say, well, pastor, if he just commissioned him, why is it that he now wants to kill him? What has happened between the commission and the campsite? You see, God was displeased with Moses because Moses deferred the leadership of the home to his wife and not to himself. You say, what do you mean? Moses had deferred to his wife whether to to, to circumcise the sons or not circumcise them. She was a Midianite. She was not Israeli. To her, it was a bloody custom that she had disdain for. So she did not circumcise the boys. This was a breach of the Abrahamic covenant that the Jews were to circumcise their sons the eighth day after their birth. If there was the breach of the Abrahamic covenant as applicable to circumcision, there were one or two consequences. First, God could either kill the individual, it was the death penalty, or secondly, they were to be excommunicated from the commonwealth of Israel. In other words, when Moses deferred to his wife, Her decision was nearly deadly, and Moses becomes incapacitated. He is frail, and he is very weak. He is so weak that he does not have the physical strength to circumcise his sons. You say, well, what is God doing in a very strategic way? God is doing this, because Zephora has taken the mantle of leadership in the home and she is resisting the Abrahamic covenant of God, God is basically bringing Sephora into submission. Sephora, either you circumcise these boys or I'm going to kill your husband. You decide whether your husband lives or whether your husband dies. And she takes a flint, a stone, a sharp stone, and she circumcises her son, and she takes the foreskin, and she throws it at the feet of Moses. In other words, she was compliant to God, but she was resentful in the process. You say, well, pastor, what are you trying to tell me? Moses' deference to his wife was almost deadly. Let the church say amen. You see, men, God has not called us to passivity God has called us to responsibility and accountability. You say, what do you mean? Everyone is accountable to God. Let the church say amen. Every last one of us are accountable to God. And every member of this church 
is accountable to the other members of this church. In other words, God holds us all accountable. Why is God holding Moses accountable? Moses, how are you going to stand up to Pharaoh when you can't stand up to your wife in the home? How are you going to stand up to the most revered, powerful leader upon the face of the earth who has the greatest military known to man at that time? If you cannot stand up to Sephora, how should I have expectations that you're going to stand up to Pharaoh? Leadership begins in the home. Moses' deference to his wife was nearly deadly. And I wonder today, are we succeeding or failing and our responsibilities of accountability. Oh, well, it doesn't make any difference how old you are. We're all to be accountable to God and to one another. You may be 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. And guess what? We're to be watching over one another in brotherly love. If you have a peer in the church and they are not walking with God, and they're doing things that are objectionable and offensive to God, and they're doing things to perhaps put themselves at risk or endanger others because of the poor example that they are bringing forth, then you're obligated under God to go to your peer and tell them, I love you, I'm concerned about you, but this is inappropriate, this is not right, this is not God's will for you, and God is holding me accountable to love you, to pray for you, to confront you, to console you, to encourage you, to advise you. You see, beloved, the person that says nothing, does nothing, is a person that doesn't care about anything. If we love one another, then we have to watch out for one another, which means we have to be accountable to one another. I cannot help everyone in this church. Therefore, God has put us all in this church so we can help one another. I do not know everything there is to know about the members of this church. And surely, numbers of you have greater knowledge of some of the members than I do. And because you have greater knowledge and you have established relationships, you can confront them, you can counsel them, you can encourage them, you can pray for them. You see, beloved, it's not invading one's private space. It's not about being intrusive. It's about being concerned that the church say amen. You see, God has given us the responsibility of accountability. And oh, men, what about your children? Are you neglecting their spiritual growth and their development? Are they in Sunday school, youth ministry? children's ministry, short-term missions trips, and the like. Men, are you hiding behind your wife? Are you allowing her to carry the burdens of leadership and shoulder those responsibilities when in fact God has given you stronger shoulders, broader shoulders, greater muscle mass shoulders than hers, because God has uniquely designed and prepared you to shoulder burdens that he has not designed for her to bear. Men, deference to a wife can at times be deadly if she is deferring in the way of disobedience to God. But there's a second thing I want you to know. Secondly, Moses and his wife were at times distant. Moses and his wife at times were distant. Look with me, Exodus chapter 18. Turn there, Exodus chapter 18. Notice verses 1 through verse number 5. Notice what happens. Moses' father-in-law, Jephro, the priest of Midian, heard about everything that God had done for Moses and his people Israel and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jephro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zephora, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, along with her two sons, one whose name was Jerusalem, because Moses had said, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land, and the other one was Eleazar, because he had said, the God of my father was my helper and delivered me from Pharaoh's sword. Moses' father-in-law, Jephro, along with Moses' wife and sons, came to him in the wilderness where he had encamped at the mountain of God. He sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jephro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. After Moses had the incident in which Sephora had circumcised the sons, Moses is about to go back, go and carry out his commission in Egypt. But before he does, 
he sends Zephorah and the two sons back home and meet him with their father, her father, Jephro. Moses goes to Egypt without his family. And over a period of months, it took months before God would deliver Israel out of Egyptian bondage and allow them to cross the Red Sea and to enter into the wilderness. Months have transpired. And since that time, Moses had made no attempt to contact his family. Whereas Moses was once in a situation that may have involved endangerment, and he had the wherewithal, and he was using practical knowledge to send his family away, now the endangerment is now past, but his family still isn't with him. Therefore, Jephro, the father-in-law, he begins to make inquiry, how is Moses, where is Moses? And the father-in-law takes the fora and the two sons, and they go to Moses. And Jephro, the father-in-law, he literally reintroduces Zephora and the two boys to Moses. You say, well, pastor, what are you trying to tell me? In this chapter, chapter 18, God is exposing and revealing some of the frailties, blind spots of Moses. And what were some of the blind spots of Moses and frailties? He was unbalanced. Moses was so absorbed in doing God's work that he was neglecting his family in the process. Moses was so absorbed with doing God's work that he would judge the people from the beginning of the day, from sunrise to sunset, that he would entertain the people. And Moses was working, if you would, 18, 20 hours a day, and he was becoming weary. And Jephro saw all of this, and he says, Moses, you are going to waste away. You can't continue to work at this pace. Moses, why don't you identify godly men, prudent men, wise men, who can adjudicate these different cases, and only the difficult cases come to you. Moses, you cannot stay on the trajectory that you're on. Moses was unbalanced, and Jephro is bringing balance into his life. Moses was not only unbalanced in his work, but he was also unbalanced in his family domestic relationships. He was unintentionally neglecting them. Now listen to me carefully. How many men here today, you're unbalanced? Oh, you are so involved and so passionate about things outside the home. But when you walk through those doors, the only thing you do in the home is crash. The only thing you do in the home is eat. The only thing you do in the house is tell everybody to leave you alone. And then you wonder why the wife has an attitude and why the children don't have much conversation or anything to say to you. Why? Because you're unbalanced. You have expended yourself in the things of this world, whether it's work or whatever it is, that you have so little, if anything, to give to your family. Like Moses, you are unbalanced. And I wonder, how will your children remember you? You see, they're only children for a little while. Will they remember you as that man who lived in the house but has so little time and involvement in their personal lives. Moses had to learn a lesson. There's certain needs that every household has. The need for stability, security, and sensitivity. Moses was unbalanced. And men, this is where a lot of men have compromised themselves. You see, when you compromise yourself, you lose your moral authority. That a lot of men are timid not because God has removed the mantle of leadership from them. They are timid because they sense that they have not lived up to the expectations and fulfilled the needs of the wife and the children. And if you would, they don't want to be assertive. They don't want to really say much of anything because they have already so much disappointed the family. They have concluded the best thing I can do going forward is basically be there but not be there. Be there physically, but emotionally, verbally, communication, you have checked out. 
And how many have grown up in a household in which a father you would have thought was mute, that he did not have any articulation or verbal skills, that he was just there, but there was no involvement in the life of the wife nor of the children. That's not the kind of man God has called you to be. But when you're unbalanced, it can come to that. And children grow up. And basically, they're with one parent one weekend, another parent two other weeks out of the month. And basically, they're led to think sometimes that they are inconvenience. In other words, they're interrupting your schedule. Beloved, the children do not live for you. You ought to be living for them. You have to be providing for them. You have to be nurturing them. You have to counsel them. You have to train them. Listen, if they didn't need you, God wouldn't have given them to you. You are to be there for them. Now listen, it's not only applicable to small children. In some ways, your older children have greater needs when they're older than when they were younger. Because life is filled with so many complexities and they have to make so many important decisions that have such consequence to them, they have to stay in communication with you because they don't want to have something unfortunate happen to them as a result of the lack of discernment and judgment. Beloved, as long as you have children, you need to be available. Let the church say amen. You need to be available. To your children, faith and family. Finally, Moses' life was reorganized to effectively meet the needs of God's work and his family. Beloved, consider this. How critical was the accountability and counsel that God gave, that Jephro gave Moses? Bible scholars would say this. If Jephro had not counseled Moses in the way of time management, Moses would have never written the books of the law, the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. Because you have to surmise this. If this man is adjudicating and judging the people from sunrise to sunset, how is he going to have any time to write anything? In other words, once there was time management in his life, He could appropriately give himself to the writings of Scripture, and then he could appropriately give himself to his wife Sephora and to the children, but there had to be the reorganizing and time management in his life. And how did it come about? It came about through painful correction. It came about from timely counsel. You see, beloved, pain can be a good thing. Let the church say amen. Pain can be a good thing. You see, one of the worst things that can happen to a person is this, that you can have some type of ailment or attack and have absolutely no symptoms or any pain, and it can be deadly, and you didn't have any symptoms or any pain whatsoever. Pain is a signal that something is wrong, that something needs to be attended to, And if you would, God sometimes brings painful correction into our lives so that we know there's something I need to be attentive to. It's something I must address in my life. And God brings that painful correction. But he doesn't leave you there. He provides you with timely counsel, even the Jephro to come alongside, to hold you accountable, and to guide you, and to counsel you how to properly manage your life. Now listen to me, beloved, is this. All of us have blind spots with the church. Say amen. All of us have blind spots. We all need other sets of eyes. We all need other sets of ears. We need additional eyes and we need additional ears. I need to keep your back and you need to keep my back. Why? Because we all have blind spots. And our intentions are should simply be to love one another, to hold one another accountable, to watch over one another in brotherly love. If you know that your brother or sister is struggling with an addiction, let them know, I'm praying for you. 
Encourage them in the way of counsel. Encourage them to seek out the appropriate help. Let them know I'm going to be holding you accountable. I'm going to ask you about your welfare. If I don't see you, I'm going to try to track you down and find out what's going on in your life. That's not being intrusive. That's being a Christian. You know, a person's going through marital discord. Husband over here, the wife over there, and a circus is going on. And you let them know, I'm praying for you. Are you doing what God would have you to do? Are you loving one another, praying for one another, helping one another? Uh, What are you doing? Holding one another accountable. No one should be able to freelance in and out of this church and no one knows what the world is going on in their lives. God loves us and God has called us to watch over one another. And if we do that, listen to me, it will be well with our souls. Because what is God doing? God is shepherding us as we shepherd one another. As I close, Moses is known as the wilderness shepherd. (laughs) He led Israel for 40 years in the wilderness, the wilderness shepherd. But listen, the wilderness shepherd had lost his way in regards to his relationship with his wife and with his children. Thank God for the Jephro who walked into Moses' life and guided Moses that he could be able to guide the people of God because you know what? Even shepherds can lose their way. Let the the church say amen. Let's all stand and look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your love and your concern for us. And, oh God, we pray that you would make us a blessing to one another. And then, God, that you would bless us. God, you love us. You love every person here today. You love every home here today. And, God, you want to bring about at sometimes painful correction and timely counsel. Lord, that you might savage, that you might restore, that you might renew, that you do something good for our, for our good and for your glory. So, Father, bless your people today. Help them to know that they're not alone. They not only have you, but they have their fellow church members. And God, help us to shepherd one another and to do it well. We ask this all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen.